All right, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 All right. One summer day back in 1974, my parents told me that I was going to meet a very special woman. And her name was Cory Timbu. And to always remember this moment. Now, I didn't know a lot about Cory at that time. All I knew is that she was Dutch, mm -hmm. and my dad was Dutch, mm -hmm. and uh, that uh, she hid some Jews in her closet, in her bedroom, or something like that. You know, a kid's logic. So, Corey at this time uh, was living in the house temporarily in Fullerton. And so, we went over to her house, and there she was. She was wearing a red dress. Oh, there it is. Wearing a red dress. Uh, you can see by looking at her hair, uh, it looked more like a, a crown. Than, than, than actual hair, <laughs> as you can see. And uh, she spoke in a very uh, aristocratic voice. It was almost as if I was meeting the Queen of the Mellows, as opposed to meeting uh, Corrie ten Boom. And she had a very strong exterior. I'm not sure if you've seen pictures of her, but she has a very strong, majestic face. And so for me, I was seven years old at this time, it's rather intimidating. So, of course, me and my brother are doing whatever kids do, and running around the yard and acting up. And there she looked at me. And she looked at me with those very piercing eyes. And she looked right through you. But what I saw was not sternness, but this deep kindness, this, this, this sweetness that I, I couldn't explain. But she looked right through me. She looked right through me. And at that moment, I knew she understood. I was a little different kid. That's the best way to put it. Um, I was very thin at the time. I was very fragile. I was extremely sensitive. Uh, I cried very easily. All components that made kindergarten an absolute nightmare. <laughs> You can imagine, unfortunately, this is really sad, unfortunately, I happened to have a kindergarten teacher that was very abusive. Not only just emotionally, I'm physically abusive. And so I suffered. And she encouraged my peers to do the same. And so day after day, you know, it was a nightmare. It was, it, was, it was, in a sense, a prison. Unfortunately, as, as things go, uh, I, by the way, I failed kindergarten. Can you believe that? <laughs> she thought, because <laughs> I didn't play well with others. I ended up going to pre-first, kind of humiliating. And then I continued in that school, and she knew all the other teachers. Teachers' lounges can be very devastating, by the way when it comes to sharing notes. And that followed me with my teachers after that and with my peers. I became a very good runner, by the way, because I was so used to running home, being chased by bullies. <laughs> it was really serious. So I was very, very, very sad seven-year-old. She looked at me. And in that moment, she seemed to understand my suffering like nobody else would. Now, this was a once-only occasion. We get to meet Cory Ten Boom. That's it, right? Well, something happened. There was this connection. And she not only wanted to see my parents again, she wanted to see the boys. She wanted to see me again. And I thought, why would she want to see me? I'm a nobody. But she thought I was a somebody. That makes sense. So, so after that, she decided to adopt herself into my family. It was the strangest thing. You know, from 1974 all the way until her death in 1983, she was there. She was there 
for birthdays. She was there for holidays. She was there just to come over to the house. She was there all the time. She was in my room. She was in the backyard. She was playing with us. We were over to her house. You see, Corey loved children. But she, she never had the opportunity to be a mother. And she never had an opportunity, therefore, to become a grandmother. Well, she decided that she's going to remedy that situation. But we became her grandkids. And she gave me the support I needed during that time. But she also gave me my self-esteem back. Mm -hmm. She taught me how to forgive that kindergarten teacher. She taught me how to forgive those, those peers. She taught me to forgive what really is unforgivable. That makes sense. So who was Corey? Let's go to the next picture. Corey was born on April 15, 1892. She was born in Amsterdam. By the way, she died on April 15th, also on her birthday. She just made a decision to, to leave her life the same date that she entered it. And uh, she was born in Amsterdam, or Amsterdam, as I would say, and she moved to Harlem. The next, uh, there, there, there's, there's a family right there. And so you have Betsy, Wilhelm, Nolly, and of course, Corey in this picture. Uh, Corey's father uh, was a watchmaker, and uh, he did his business, as they do in Holland, uh, in the same place as their residence. Uh, next picture, please. That's perfect. That's the one. And this is the Beye. This is, this is, the Dutch like to name their homes. Uh, this is just a tradition. I think it's a great tradition, too. But the Beye only stands for Barta Jorestraat, which is the name of the street that they were on. So this is a combination residence uh, as well as uh, a, a place of business. Now, now, the Dutch people, I have to say this, the Dutch people practice something uh, that is called gazelle. Does anybody know the word gazelle here? We should have this word in English, but this is what they practiced in the Bay Area. Well, gazelle is the idea. Now, after I mention this, you'll probably want to adopt this new word, gazelle. The, the, what it is, it's a combination of hospitality, of warmth, of conversation, of, of friendliness, of gratitude, of generosity. Gazelle, uh, to me, is cookies and milk with friends, or for us adults, cookies and coffee, or tea, perhaps, right? Gazelle is sitting back uh, around a warm fire, having great conversation, perhaps having a drink or two. Gazelle is his family, it's home. But the Dutch people have that word, gazelle, to explain all of that. Right? So they practiced the art of gazelle. That means everybody was family. And they took care of people in need. If you were hungry, the Ten Boom family would feed you. If you were sad, the Ten Boom family would listen to you. If you uh, were, were um, uh, in desperate need in any way, they were there. And they prayed with you. They spent time with you. And they also did a great job in following. They practiced the art of gazelle. Now, later on, uh, when I uh, uh, was, was, you know, got to know, know Corey, they, uh, Corey moved to Placentia. You probably didn't know that. Corey to Boom of the Netherlands moves to Placentia. <laughs> and that's what's Corey and Placentia. So she had a home that she called the Shalom House. That's the name of that house. And whenever I went over to that house, it was always a, a feeling or a sense of gazelle. But she did the ultimate hospitality, which I haven't talked about. She had another house in the Netherlands during the 1960s and 1970s. It's called the Agape House. It was an overbay. Agape meaning love, grief. And she decided that uh, she's going to open that home to us. 
I lived in Corey's home for seven months in 1979. So I lived in Holland. I lived in her home. And so I got to know Corey in that sense too. So, so I got a chance to, to walk through that home and, and read the personal letters that, 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 that people wrote her from all around the world because she traveled all around the world later on. And it was interesting because I found that she had family everywhere. And she always practiced the art of gazelle with them. If that makes sense, right? Now, Corey came from a Christian background. And she always believed in, you know, that studying the Bible is important. But she also emphasized critical thought, which was, by the way, unusual. So they would read the Bible in Dutch. They would read it in English. They would read it in French. And they read it in German. But they also read it in the original languages. Hebrew and Greek. And because of this, they learned to cherish a love for the Jewish people through understanding the language, getting into the culture, the Jewish culture. So their, their hearts burned with fire and passion for the Jews early on because of that nurturing now, uh, also, um, Corey, by the way, um, uh, they, you know, they, they were very much into study groups. Corey continued this tradition. So Corey would come over to our house, or we'd go over to her house, and we would also have Bible studies and conversations and dissecting these ideas. My, my dad uh, is a professor. Uh, he also, he's a professor of, of history, but he also teaches religion. It kind of sounds familiar. <laughs> and... Um, and uh, so she was very much into his academic perspective on things. So we would be there. Um, now I have to mention that we discuss theology constantly or religion in different ways. Sometimes, uh, oh, basically, I, I don't have to mention this, her business would be as follows. She would come over and we'd have coffee. And then we'd have conversation. And then we'd have dinner. And then we'd have conversation. And then we had coffee. And then we had conversation until late in the night. That's the way Corey was. That's the way she always wanted to be. Now, officially, her and her family were part of the Dutch Reformed Church. But in reality, they did not quite toe the line of that particular Protestant dominant denomination. Uh, she believed that... Uh, that to know God was to live in faith, that God brought people together rather than keep them apart, that God was all about love and forgiveness. Those who spent all their time pursuing every possible theological nuance did not get the idea of what love is. Love was a verb. It's an action. It shouldn't be all about what's up here. It needs to be here. She often said to be simple is to be great. Don't overthink things. Just let the love of God bring us all together. And so the idea of a denomination bothered her. I'm going to read something that most people, if you've had a chance to uh, go through the internet looking at Corey Ten Boom, I'm going to read you a quote that most people don't know about. About who she is. She says this, this is a quote. Maybe I'm exaggerating a little, but I feel a little out of balance myself. I do not belong in our Reformed Church, nor in the Christian Reformed Church. Also, the other small fundamentalist circles do not satisfy me. I'm quoting her. I have studied too much church history for that, but then where do I belong? Does that make sense? Right? So what you read online, she's claimed by certain groups. I'm here to liberate Corey. <laughs> liberate, free her from that stereotype. 
Does that make sense? That was not what she was about, knowing her personally. And she struggled with those people. She fought with those people. She was embarrassed by those people. She was all about love and all about unity and all about forgiveness, not about walls dividing people. Right? Now, of course, um, she loved you, whether you were a Christian, whether you're a Jew, whether you're Muslim, whether you're a Hindu, she loved you all. She loved you all. And she also enjoyed studying different religions. She did. Different perspectives. Getting different ideas. Now, Corey also truly loved life. She was a voracious reader. Uh, she would, at one time, she looked at a beautiful snow scene and she says, it was so unreal, so like a fairy story that I would not have been surprised if I had met dwarves or nymphs. She had a great imagination. Well, I had a great imagination. So we would talk together about imaginative things. I had invented this pretend city called La Vista. <laughs> and, uh, you know, located in the Baltic Sea near Sweden. I have no idea what I was doing. But the point is, she would listen to these stories. I was a big Star Trek fan. <laughs> and she would, she would listen to my prattle and how I want to live in outer space someday, you know. But she would listen and she was amused, but she enjoyed the imagination. She was all about it. Now, Corey was a very strong lady and filled resolve. Yet she was the first to realize that there was a bigger picture and that she cannot understand it all. You know what she used to do? She used to sit there and it was a quilt. She would be knitting away at a quilt as she's doing a talk. So she just knit, 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 and she'd talk and talk, and she's so good, she, you, know, you wouldn't even see what she's doing. She'd be just... And then at a certain point, she would lift the quilt up and she would show the back side. And the back side, the strings and the threads would go everywhere. And she would say, this is the way we see the world. This is the way we see the universe. It's all a mess. It's going everywhere. It's going this way and that way. Then she'd turn around. She said, this is the way, this is the way God sees the world. This is the way we should see the world. And it was this beautiful crown. Because we have victory. We will be victorious. It all makes sense. She wrote a poem, actually. This is her poem. My life is but a weaving between my God and me. I cannot choose the colors. He weaveth steadily. Off time, he weaveth sorrow. And I have foolish pride. Forget he sees the upper and I the underside. Not till the loom is silent and the shuttle cease to fly, will God enroll the canvas and reveal the reason why. The dark threads are as needful in the weaver's skillful hand as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. He knows, he loves, he cares. Nothing this truth can dim. He gives the very best to those who leave the choice to him. You know, you understand that there is dark and there's light, but it all makes sense. She had to have this mentality to survive what she's going to go through. Now, uh, following World War I, most people don't know this, uh, she, uh, you know, Germany lost. <laughs> uh, they lost. And, uh, but, and of course, a lot of people were angry with the Germans at that time. She created a program to help the German orphans. She brought them in, into the Netherlands. She found them homes. In fact, even had her place as a home for them. Because she saw the human being, not the race or the group. Does that make sense? Now, uh, Corey did not have conventional attitudes about women at that time. Being taught, she was taught that she could do anything that a man can do. So what she did, uh, which is interesting, is she decided to become a watchmaker just like her father. And she went to Switzerland, studied watchmaking, and became the very first female watchmaker in the Netherlands. Talk about breaking stereotypes at that time. You know, these are the 20s. 
Then uh, what happened is, of course, later on in life, I have to mention this, uh, she became a preacher, a teacher, and she spoke at the pulpit. Well, many people were upset. They go, no woman is allowed to be up there, she said. <laughs> only, only men are supposed to be up there. Corey is great. Uh, now, a long time ago when I was a kid, I went to a church that didn't believe in female pastors. Obviously, I changed my mind. <laughs> so I went there, and the pastor had just recently did a series on this fact. So my family brings Corey and Boone to the church, and she sits right in the front row. And the pastor's there, he's doing his thing, and Corey's just staring. And he's trying to teach, and she still stares. Um, and Corey, the movie The Hiding Place just came out. She's well known. Um, would you like to come up and say a word or two? <laughs> Corey went up. She had this piercing smile, and she began to preach on that pulpit and nobody said a word and she kept going because when Corey spoke people listened gender divisions no longer matter to them does that make sense she had this power and afterwards the pastor thanked her for her servant because that was Corey does that make sense you know she's a pioneer this is the 1970s I mean, we remember the 70s especially within those kinds of circles. Now, the Corey, the Tim Boone family also became involved with foster children in 1925, and after that, at one point, they had as many as seven foster children at the Bay Area. Then, Corey noticed that many teenage girls did not have all the same uh, groups as teenage boys. And she, she thought, well, teenage girls need as, as, as many programs and exciting things as teenage boys. That's not fair, so she created what's called the Church Walk Club. And they meet at 8.30 a.m. every Sunday morning, and they walk in out to nature, and they get to look at the trees, and go through the dunes, and had a wonderful time together, had great conversations. And they came back for church service, uh, which was at 10. Well, these groups started to become more and more popular. Girls are, were, were getting into this. This is, this is a wonderful time. And as a result, it spread to become what's called the Triangle Girls Club, which is the, 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 girl, the Dutch Girl Scouts. So she created the Dutch Girl Scouts program. So you can see she's more than just uh, somebody that went through the Holocaust. She did active service all the way through. Now, she loved clubs. There's a reason why I'm bringing this up. But why are you bringing this up? She loved clubs. And so when she heard that I wanted to form a club, she was very into it, uh, very much. And so what happened was this. I wanted to form a Star Trek club. <laughs> and uh, this, now this was the year uh, 1977 now. And she was very excited by the fact that I had, first of all, not only a club, but I had friends to be in that club. Remember the earlier story. But see, Corey was part of contributing to my self-esteem that I can forgive and I can have former enemies as friends in my club. And they were. Now, this is the part of the story which is interesting. My, my parents didn't believe in, in me using nails to build a club because, you know, I might you know, hurt myself. It's almost like shooting my eye out from some kind of movie that happened on Christmas. Anyway, so they said, there's no nails. I built this club based upon, this is really sad, uh, what I did is, is I got, I had chicken wire from my mom's tomato plant. And, uh, and I got chicken wire, I combined it with lumber, and I bounced it vicariously between the back bushes and the back wall and fence. And then I, I you know, that, that was my club. So, so, you know, Corey arrives at the house, and she's like, I want to see this club. My parents panic. 
It's in the back bushes. It's dirty. There's rats back there. She's determined. I want to go to that club. I want to dedicate it. I want to pray over it. So here goes marching this 19th century woman in her well, well very nice dress. And she marches back into the back bushes. And she goes into the back bushes and she, she you know, leans down because it was low even at that time. And all of a sudden, she started to, she dedicated the place like she was a mayor dedicating a famous public structure. <laughs> she just put this whole profuse dedication, like this was the most important building that, uh, that, that stands. And then she gave me 12 copies of her comic book, The Hiding Place to Give to All My Club Members. That was Corey Ten Boom. Does that make sense? Humility. You know, doesn't care about getting dirty because she loved me. Now, um, I want to mention that uh, I guess we're getting to World War II, and she was a member of the Dutch Underground. By 1942, Corey and her family had become leaders of the Dutch Underground, and their focus was on helping Jews find places, not necessarily at their place, but to distribute them out to the countryside, to Switzerland, or wherever it may be. Now, when we see the hiding place, you'll think that there's just, you're just, you know, one group of, of Jews that were there and that was it. That, that's not the way the Bay Area was. It was a revolving door where they would have Jews come in and then they would distribute them to different places and that's the way they did things. Also, uh, they had a, a ministry whereby they would take Jewish babies and Corey would bicycle them out to the countryside where my relatives, the Rietfelds, would receive them and then would hide them in various places or have them adopted to different families. So there's this reciprocal relationship. In fact, the name Rietfeld is what made Corey uh, want to meet us in the first place. Rietfelds, oh, I know them. Oh, I used to bike out to the countryside, you know, to your relatives. So that was the connection, if that makes any sense. So, Corey uh, helped save so many Jews. Now, I, 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 Corey also built a hiding place. Uh, the hiding place was built in Corey's room. Uh, uh, here, a second wall was built towards the back of her room, two by eight feet and a cupboard with shelves on it placed in front of the second wall. The Jews would only go here during emergencies. Uh, they had everything kind of all uh, set up where if there was a, a fear that the, the Nazis were at the door, they had a certain alarm system where they would be up there within a few minutes and they'd be hidden in there, whoever was there. Now, as I said, there's many different uh, groups that, of Jews that, that were there. There was at one point a, a cantor uh, from a synagogue in, in Amsterdam that was there who performed for them. You'd think the neighbors would notice, but anyway. Uh, and they had also, because they took advantage of the gazelle idea, they had classes on Judaism. They had classes in Hebrew. They also had classes in Italian. Uh, they had other kinds of classes, like on astronomy of all things. And they, and they practiced gazellic with them. Now, at one point, uh, Papa Tin Boom uh, suffered loss. And because of their attitude uh, of gazellic, uh, Corey says, during the short afternoon, this is to help uh, Papa Tin Boom out, they kept coming. The people who counted themselves as father's friends, young and old, poor and rich, scholarly gentlemen, uh, and illiterate servant girls. Only to father did it seem that they were all alike. That was father's secret. Not that he overlooked the differences in people, but he didn't know they were there. That was the secret of the, of the Tim Boom family. But it happened. In 1944, February 28th, a supposed friend of the family turned out to be a Gestapo agent. Somebody they died with, somebody who they counted as their friend, somebody they, they practiced gazelle with, turned them in. How about betrayal? Corey was, was uh, they were arrested. Uh, they arrested Corey, her sister Betsy, and her 84-year-old father. Corey was first taken to Schemenegen Prison 
in the Netherlands, where her father would soon die. The food was cold, the cell cramped, and there was no fresh air. Corey said the place was gruesome. It stenched of burned bones. There was three crematoria in Schevenagen at the time. Uh, she would sit there in her cell and she would hear the machine guns and, you know, go off at different times. But at the same time, people were being executed left and right, constantly. And she had to be in this environment. But then, she says, then suddenly, she says, this is, I'm reading her, I remembered Enoch. He was not filled with homesickness when he walked with God. And so I was no longer alone either. God was with me, hand in hand, and we walked on. And we saw the blue sky and the flowers and the flowering shrubs. And I could see the yard as part of a beautiful, free world. Where I would be allowed to walk once again. In the same way, earth is a lovely garden. In heaven, the liberty where great joys await us as children of the light. She turned that darkness into light. She was free. I want to, I want to say this. She said that uh, happiness isn't something that depends on our surroundings. It's something we make inside of ourselves. She also believed in the power of prayer to change a bad situation. She said, what wings are to a bird and sails to a ship, so is prayer to the soul. Next, next, Corey was moved to a concentration camp known as Vault, and from there hurled into a boxcar headed for Robinsbrook. Eighty women were pushed into each boxcar with little air or water for three days straight. Many died along the way. Robinsbrook housed 132,000 women and children. Of the 132,000, 92,000 of them would die. 92,000. Many out of starvation or hard labor, but most through systematic executions. Those who say that there is no Holocaust fail to talk to the people who are there. She said that the soldiers, the guards, learned lessons of cruelty, and it was the deepest hell that man can create. Yet in the middle of the nightmare, both Corey and Betsy had hope and were full of life, love, even towards those who were seeking to harm them, to kill them. Corey often said, in darkness, God's truth shines most clear and said joy runs deeper than despair. Corey did not tell what happened in Robinsbrook, all that happened in Robinsbrook and in her, her book. I want to mention this. This is something else. When Corey had her various strokes, uh, she uh, had to be bathed. And my mom used to bathe her. And as she bathed her, she looked at her back and it was ripped full of, of whip marks. She had been beaten brutally. But she chose not to tell that story. Why? Because she chose not to be the victim. She said, I want to say, she always said this, I always want to show them as much so they know that I had a lot to forgive and nothing more. I don't want them to feel sorry for me. I want them to learn to forgive. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So she kept this back. But it doesn't mean it was easy. Uh, one time, Corey and I, we, she wanted to see Star Wars. So we went to go see Star Wars. And she was enjoying herself. She was enjoying herself. She was, she liked the Jawas. Uh, she thought they were cute and she, you know. But there was a scene where she become, became unraveled. Well, of course, she didn't like the stormtroopers and thought they looked like Nazis, but, but there's a scene where Princess Leia is in her cell, and she's in confinement, and there's a probe that, 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 that floats toward her with a needle. That bothered her so much, she stood up and she walked out. Forgiveness doesn't mean that we still don't hurt. Does that make sense? We still hurt. We can forgive and still feel the pain. We just released ourselves from that burden, from that chain 
of oppression and depression from those individuals who did these things to us. Does that make sense? So, so people say, oh, forgiveness. That means you forget. No, you forgive and you remember, but you still love them anyway. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, I have to say that yet concerning her time of imprisonment, uh, she said, love is larger than the walls which shut her in. One day, Betsy had a vision. She told Corey as follows. A camp, a concentration camp, but we are in charge. She said the camp was in Germany. It was no longer a prison, but a home where German people who had been warped by this philosophy of hate and force would come to learn another way. There were no walls, no barbed wire, and the barracks had window boxes. It would be so good for them watching things grow. People can learn to love from flowers. Later on, she told Corey, we must tell them what we learned here. We must tell them there is no pit so deep that he is not deeper still. They will listen to us. Corey, because we have been here. On December 16, 1944, Betsy died. Two weeks later, Corey was released from Robinsbrook, yet later on she discovered she was not supposed to be released at all, that it was actually a clerical error. All women her age were gassed one week after her release. Forgiveness. This is the key to Corey's survival. In fact, Corey became freer in her heart in that concentration camp than many of us who walk outside of such confinement today. She found her freedom and forgiveness. Her complete surrender to God enabled her to forgive, permitted her to love. We often say that those who hurt us don't deserve our forgiveness. But I must ask the question, do we deserve losing our freedom to, to thrive, to love, to spiritually grow? Because we feel we can punish them through not forgiving them. Do they really deserve to hold such an influential place in our lives? For in reality, we are not punishing them by our lack of forgiveness. We are punishing ourselves. By forgiving them, we set ourselves free from their power, from their imprisonment of our spirit. Right? Now, I'm just going to wrap up real quick here. I do want to mention that following her release from Robinsbrook, she returned to Harlem. She found her home uh, stripped. But she said, hold everything in your hands lightly. Otherwise, it hurts when God fries your fingers open. Right? <laughs> but here, Corey decided to take the next step. It's not just enough to forgive. It, you take the next step. And you do something about it. What did he do? Well, what she did is she found that collaborator, that Gestapo agent who betrayed her. He was in prison on death row. She wrote him a letter. I have, she writes, forgiven you of everything. God will forgive you too. He loves you. She writes, she said, never doubt the love of the Lord Jesus. He is waiting to receive you with outstretched arms. Outstretched stretched arms. It's a, you know, to this person who betrayed her. Next, Corey focused upon finding those people. Because once again, she didn't see the Germans as a group. She saw the heart of the individuals. And she knew that there were many Germans on the inside that helped her. And tried to save the Jews from the inside. What was Hans Brahms? And there's a few others. She put a list together. She knew the queen of, of, of the Netherlands, Queen Wilhelmina, and she presented this to the queen. And the queen, based upon her confession, released these individuals from death row. Hans Brahms was released after two years. Why? Because they did the best they could in the position that they were at. She was forgiven, but she went further than that. You think that, well, that's, that's enough. Stop, right? She went further than that. She went to Germany, and she went to a concentration camp known as Darmstadt, and she remembered Betsy's vision, and she turned that concentration camp into a German rehabilitation camp with window boxes, just as she said. This is amazing. She went through, they had 85 Refugees at a time, and as soon as the homes were built for those 85 refugees, another 85 would take place. She was all about forgiveness. 
And of course, we have the famous moment where she met the individual, the guard in Munich, the former SS man who, start, who stood guard over her. She talked about Betsy's pain, blanched face. She was talking to Munich. He approached her, and he wanted to know if Corey could forgive him. Well, he was, you know, he was, he was there. Could you forgive somebody like that? Could you forgive somebody that was there, who, was, who contributed to your sister's death? Could you do it? Corey looked at him. She felt cold. She's all, but she, she took out her, her hand, and the most incredible thing happened. She said, for my shoulder and along my arm and through my heart, a current seemed to pass from me to him, while into my heart sprang a love for the stranger that overwhelmed me. And so I discovered that it is not our forgiveness any more than our goodness that the world's healing hinges hangs. And she forgave him. She said, forgiveness is the key that unlocks the door of resentment and the handcuffs of hatred. It is a power that breaks the chains of bitterness and the shackles of selfishness. She became what was called the tramp for the Lord. She traveled all the way throughout the world. Uh, one time she was in Australia, and this, this young girl came up to her and said, thank you for saving my life. And she's all, but you're too young. And she said, no, I was one of the Jewish babies that uh, you biked out to the countryside, and you saved my life. She had a heart of forgiveness. She Later on, as I knew her, she had a heart for the Native Americans. Uh, they, uh, in fact, the Native Americans, um, uh, in 1978, the Hopi tribe, uh, gave her the name Loma C and, uh, and made her an official member of the tribe. Most people don't know this. She was honored at Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Memorial, as one of the righteous, because she saved so many Jews. The Queen of the Netherlands proclaimed her a Knight of the Order of Orange Nassau. She became, she was knighted for her actions. Yet everything was about humility. In conclusion, for me, Corey taught me to forgive those who hated me because I was different and even to love them despite it all. The act of forgiveness accomplished through God's love, through God's love in me, helped heal me. This act of forgiveness reignited the love in me and set me free. I have to say that every one of my childhood bullies I have made a resolution with sometime during my life, and many are my friends today. Right? I learned that I could forgive myself from her too. Forgive myself for being different and for not conforming to other people's expectations of me. I realized, realized if I succumb to what they wish, I would lose me in the process, and that doing so would be the actual loss. I learned that God's love is deeper still than anything else, and that this love actually resided in me. And I needed to continually open myself to this love so that it could flow freely from me to others. I realized that love begets love. Corey also validated my mystical experiences. One day, Corey noticed me seeing exactly what she was seeing at that moment. And she said, do you see that too? And I said, yes. She said, never close that door. That never did. One last quote. Do you know what hurts so very much? She says, it's love. Love is the strongest force in the world. And when it is blocked, that means pain. There are two things we can do when this happens. We can kill that love so that it stops hurting. But then, of course, part of us to. Or we could ask God to open up another route for that love to travel and surrender to its freedom. Thank you.